ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second episode of Peer to Peer Conversations. And I am delighted to welcome a good friend of mine, uh, but also a great leader, of course, Mr. Dare, who is the founder and CEO of MFS. Dare, how are you doing? I'm great. And you, Mohit? I'm good. Normally, we would do this with a bottle of red wine between us. Uh, a few, <laughs> few bottles, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> But now we're having to do this in the new world, right? This is the new, uh, the new norm, I guess. Um, Indeed. How are things with you? You're keeping well? Keeping good. You know, I calling from Johannesburg today. Things are kind of better than they were, you know, uh, six months, six months, even three months ago. Here, where we we had a second wave. So now we're down to what we call level one, which means we can. Do pretty much everything as long as we wear mask and respect the, the distance and the measures so yeah i'm still working from home as you can see but uh, generally looking positive we're just waiting for our vaccines then uh, hopefully we yeah. can meet in person again <laughs> yeah fingers crossed i can't wait um, so dari let's um, start with you tell me a little bit about you um you know this is like confession time right to so think of it like <laughs> only it's just you and me nobody else <laughs> and it's about yeah. to know you as an individual which of course i know i think relatively well but it'll be great for everybody else so tell me about you but also you before mfs you know what was yeah. the journey that got you there sure so i i am from benin uh uh, not from Nigeria, and, and though my name suggests that, which I also I keep it going. I don't really correct people, but I'm from Benin. I'm a Yoruba. Most Yorubas are from Nigeria, but some of us are multi generation from Benin. And uh, I was born there, bred, schooled until uh, the age of 17, the, the finishing high school. And right after I finished high school, um, I got an opportunity to go on a scholarship to Morocco to, to enter a program toward the uh, engineering degree uh, in Morocco. Mm -hmm. So I left Benin in 94, just after I turned 18, and found myself after a pretty long journey in Tanja, in the very north, north part of Morocco, yeah. uh, in something called Place Preparatoire which is part of the French kind of system. Uh, you study, you do a lot of math and physics for two years, then you do a competitive exam and depending on your ranking, you end up in what is called the Grand Ecole. Uh, and there was the Moroccan version and then, uh, you know, which was emulating the French Grand Ecole. So mm. I ended up doing, uh, it was my first, you know, living experience, 18, it, it was uh, starting my life of migrants, I would say. And yeah. uh, if you know if you know anything about Tanger, you know that uh, um, they have something called La Promenade des Paresseux. It's like a street right on the beach. And at night, if you stand there, you can see the lights of uh, Spain, of the closest city of Spain. Um, I think it's about 14 kilometers. And, uh, and this is 94, yeah. uh, 95. And people were already jumping in the water trying to swim across <laughs> back then. So normally when they see people, Africans uh, like myself from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, they suspect that they're going to jump at any time. So, <laughs> so I had to reassure people working there that no, I'm not here <laughs> to jump in the water. I'm just here for the studies. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was a pretty hard experience uh, just you know, finding yourself so young in a foreign mm. country and um, Pretty difficult program it was, and you know I was not really mentally prepared for it. I had no idea what it was, but it was quite intense. But mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to kind of get through it, and I guess good enough to qualify to do my second year in Casablanca. So I left Tanger after one year, mm -hmm. went to Casablanca, uh, did the second year there in the in, in Casablanca. Then I had the opportunity to not only compete for the Moroccan school but also compete for the French schools. So. I ended up taking both exams, uh, and I did well enough to to be able to choose the French school, and I chose to go to Telecom in Paris. So I left Morocco at the end of that second year, 
And uh, 96, I, I went to Paris, find myself in this Grande Ecole, again, not fully realizing what it meant, but it was indeed uh, the beginning of something great. Um, and it's, it was one of the last Grande Ecole in Paris itself. So I was in the 13th arrondissement, uh, you know, just great life. I mean, and everybody tells you, it, it, the city you turn 20 tend to be kind of second home. And that was Paris for me. Mm -hmm. So I really spent you know, wonderful years. It was a three years program to, to get a master degree, counting the two years that we have done before yeah. getting into the. So I felt really that the world was my oyster. I could do anything. And one of the things that was always in my mind was to go to the US. Um, so when the opportunity came to do my internship, before graduation, you have to do six months practicals, right. you know, so you work in a company and you do that and then you come back to the school for six months and then you graduate. So my six months was 98, uh, where I went to, I chose to go to the US and I joined a startup uh, called Algorex uh, at that time. And uh, the, the startup was formed by ex Lucent engineers, uh, the Lucent the Bell Labs, um, and was working. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, mind you, we were working on building ADSL modems. So ADSL was a research subject at that time. So most, yeah. most internet was a dial-up, right? Or people who had like special lines, exactly. We're giving our so, age away there. <laughs> I know, I know. So if you use ADSL, I had something to do with it. But it was also New York. It was right. 98. France just won the World Cup. Um, the world, you know, the dot com, everything yeah. was great. But the one thing I took out of it was how how hungry I was to understand the why. You know, my job then as an intern was really we had, it was you know I had to simulate this one transmission channel and optimize the uh, what they call the probability of error on that mm. channel. So very very limited view of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't stop asking myself, why am I even doing this? Uh, what, what is the ADSL? What? And to the point where at the end, when I wrote my thesis, it was not so much about my technical work, but it was more about the promise of ADSL in the world that we we're about to see and how we could compete with uh, satellite and fiber, which were really kind of the the other large alternative for, for high, high um, large bandwidth uh, that we were talking about at that time. So anyway, I came out of that experience where I was pretty certain that I didn't want to work as an engineer in that yeah. deep as I was doing, but I would be more interested to in understand how to translate that into business. So that's how I joined PwC instead of uh, the R&D department of France Telecom. So this is still New York, is it? No, actually. So when I finished, I went back to Paris to complete okay. my degree. Uh, and then I, uh, I joined PwC based in Paris, but covering right. the, the team was covering Europe, Middle East and Africa. And at that right. time also, there was a lot of, I mean, telecom and media was so booming that the project were global. You could find yourself pretty much anywhere. Right. So, I found myself back in Morocco, uh, working with Maroc Telecom on launching the prepaid uh, service uh, called Jawal. At that time, we had a guy called uh, Jamel Debouze, which is a celebrity. I don't know if he watched your show, but Jamal was a big celebrity back then that, you know, that, that we worked with. So, I, you know, I worked in Morocco uh, a little bit, but a lot of work in France. Then 3G was becoming a thing and PwC was involved a lot in assisting mm -hmm. new entrants, but also in comment of thinking through 3G, what it meant. Um, but also a lot of work in the media industry, did a lot of work with Canal Plus on replicating what is now known by everybody, like the PVR, you know, press pause on the TV. Uh, mm. Early 2000, that was like novelty. There was only two companies in the world called T one TiVo, one called Replay in the US. And right. we did a project to replicate this. <laughs> In, uh, in France for Canal Plus, uh, but also a lot of work at the, really what was, there was a big theme at that time called the convergence between telecom and media. 
and there was, I mean, newspapers and consultants were having field days analyzing who's going to win. You know, is it the people with the content, mm -hmm. the media company, or is it the telecom? We saw the AOL Time Warner merger at that time that reset right. everything we knew about merger and acquisition. And in France, Vivendi became a bit that emulation, acquiring mm -hmm. licenses. Yeah. France Telecom having to respond, rebranding to Orange. So there were, again, fantastic years. Everything was going well until 9-11. Yeah. And it just, it came to a crash, like the whole thing. And the bubble on the, kind of the internet bubble, which right. everybody knew was kind of a bubble, but everybody was kind of going with it. It was yeah. brutal. And um, the rest, well, we could not choose anymore which project we worked on. So, you know, I got sent on working on aerospace projects. So I, I worked for almost, you know, this is now 2002, 2003. 2002, I worked on uh, Airbus. I joined the team that was helping Airbus first on integrated as Airbus. Before that, it was, there was a German company, a French company, a Spanish company, and the, and the British company all different, but collaborating to create the planes. And somewhere early 2000, they decided to actually form one company that is now Airbus as we know it. And that kind of post-merger integration, uh, you know, I joined a team of consultants to make sure we realize the synergies. It was less fun, as you can imagine, we move from think, you know, market, future looking stuff to literally mm -hmm. counting on yeah. spreadsheet, how many people and <laughs> warehouses and, <laughs> You know, yeah. difficult, but, but, but it was, it was, uh, I, spent, I ended up spending almost two years with Airbus as a client. So as much as it wasn't kind of glamorous, it was very, very enriching personally. And I learned a lot as being a manager, I would say from that experience more than I learned uh, in the, in the first part. Anyway, by then I was, I think I was running the course of the consulting experience. So I was getting a little bit cynical about it, like every consultant at some point, right. you know, wondering what impact your beautiful slides are having uh, <laughs> and uh, aligning the bullet point and your magical spreadsheet and, and, and all these things. Oh. So I was getting a little bit edgy and, and, and I was also wondering more and more about coming back to Africa because after I left since 94, I mean, technically I've been in 94, I left Africa in 96 going to France. I, I, I didn't, I come back for holidays sometimes, but that was it. My life moved to, you know, being a migrant and mm -hmm. just being in all different places. So I, I was, I started just wondering, what, was there a path for me to come back? And uh, the first path I thought was going to be a path of vol volunteering. So I actually joined an NGO. So uh, to, mm -hmm. with another friend of mine who was also at PwC and, uh, I call him the philosopher. He's always asking questions about meaning of life and you know why the, the, the sun is rising that side. The kind of guy who always asks the questions about life. Anyway, so we, him and well, I, I, just, just, I said I do the same thing, but it's normally after a lot of drinks. <laughs> no, no, Salah, he didn't need a lot of drinks <laughs> to do that. He didn't need a lot of no, drinks, he, right? didn't, he wasn't natural. Anyway, him and I. Uh, <laughs> left PwC briefly to join this, uh, to work for this refugee service, I think it was called Jesuit oh. Refugee Services, as a voluntary work in the north part of Tanzania, at the border of Burundi. Uh, there was a refugee camp that was supposed to be temporary, but by the time we got there, it has been there for seven years. It has followed you know, all the events that happened in Burundi. This were Burundian, not, not the Rwanda side. Um, and, you know, kids were born there, were growing up there. And the job was to create, uh, to do sports camp for these kids. So nothing to do with business, anything we knew. We were just both very fan of football and we play Saturday mornings and we thought we knew enough about that to organize mm. sports camp. So. Anyway, we, we flew there and uh, that was a completely different experience also. Like, yeah. I think, long story short, I, we didn't stay long. We, we went back to work for PwC. But, uh, but what it did, what, what, I, took, I took a few things out of it. One, 
up to that point, I always, I would say I'm a left guy and I'm still out, but I was very much left in that sense that, you know, business is just evil kind of profit is driving everything. And, mm. you know, to change the world, you have to remove profit motive a little bit. I was, um, you know, think about being tortured, working for PwC and having those thoughts. So right. that, that, that was me. In New York. <laughs> in New York, exactly, in yeah. the dot com. So anyway, so yeah. I, uh, but what, 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 what this experience did to me was to confront me with that reality and to check if actually the NGO or the, if you remove profit, do you actually really gain much more? And I came out of yeah. that thinking, no, actually, that, that uh, despite the best intentions and everybody I met, they had the best intention, but the system was very perverse. And, you know, we, there was an NGO to provide anything from soap to, to cooking oil, to clothes, to food. Mm. And there was days of distribution. People would just line up and kids were growing up watching their parents lining up for stuff. And mm. it just, and meanwhile, the UN organizing the whole thing, there was like a, a squat court. I learned to play squat in that camp. So on one side, you have all these big four by fours. And so it was just a whole weird thing going on. And, mm. and although, as again, the people intention were the best, they had their heart in their hand. Everybody was genuinely caring for, for the ch children. I was just like, this thing has no future. If you grow up here, what, what I mean, you need to be so exceptional and so lucky right, to, to make out. it out, yeah. to make it yeah. out. And, yeah. and I'm always about the chance to the average person. You know, I think a good society is the one that you don't need to be exceptional to get to prosperity. Right. You can be an average person and things will work out. And there was no chance it will happen in that game. And, and I, that, I, I thought, look, business with all these problems, is actually creates the right incentives. If you know you have to manage the extremities, but it will be it's still a better way to to generate progress, to to bring prosperity. And I left now knowing that I've dealt with that part of myself. Like mm -hmm. you know, I was no longer thinking about you know changing the world in that way. And uh, but I was also also convinced that my future was not to be a partner at PwC or any consulting company for that matter. Mm -hmm. That I was more driven by being on the field. And as much as I enjoy the intellectual curiosity of the consulting life, I'm, I'm more about the action. I, I wanted to make decisions, you know, not give advice to people who make decisions. So that, that was a little bit too, uh, again, not saying that consulting don't make decisions. It's just, I felt, I felt like I needed to be on the pitch, not on the sideline a little bit. Uh, from, so that's, that's kind of, you know, where I started thinking about how to do this and, you know, talking to different people, MBA uh, ideas start coming up, you know, a few people at PwC has gone through different MBAs, start talking to them. Mm -hmm. And and eventually, yeah, just, I was not 100% sold on it. Um, I was not, uh, but, but I thought it was a good way to, to change, to do career switch, to find a way to Africa and, and build a network that if things don't work out in Africa, I can always call on to come back somewhere to Europe mm -hmm. as well. So I did the, all the triangulation uh, and I found that the one year programs would be the cheapest because <laughs> literally it's half the price and, and half the time. And uh, yeah. then there was uh, IMD in, uh, I think in Switzerland and there was INSEAD in, in Fontaine. Yeah. So I ended up in INSEAD. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, and then from there again, really, really being a lucky guy, I think the, you know, I, met, I met other people, other opportunities came about, especially one of my house mates who became one of my best friend, best man at my wedding, I was best man at his wedding, came from South Africa, has just spent five years in South Africa. Uh, he's Swedish himself and he couldn't stop talking about South Africa. And up to that point in my life, South Africa was not even on my radar. When I think about mm -hmm. Africa, 
I'm thinking about West Africa, you know, Benin, where I'm come from, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, maybe Nigeria, but that was it. You know, I wouldn't even do Kenya at that right. time. And uh, well, one thing leading to the other, you know, we started, you know, I started learning more about South Africa. And there were a few people who came from South Africa on campus that year, you know, this is now 2005. And one of them invited the famous South African finance minister, Trevor Manuel, who gave a speech to call the African student out for dinner, spoke more about South Africa. So it was all about South Africa. And I ended up taking a closer look at, okay, what is, what is this? Uh, so I applied to different companies and uh, funny enough, so MTN was one of them, but uh, the best of the best was actually, I, I won't say the name of the company because the story is a bit funny because I applied to this company and uh, I got a letter back that they could not hire me because of the policy in South Africa that required them to hire black people. So, so <laughs> clearly someone did not actually take a, I don't know, Dario Kuju sounds pretty black, but, but anyway, they did the Google, they just, you know, assume this letter is coming from France. It's the uh, device with some, some white person applying it. They just sent me this, which was beautiful because I'm like, gee, I can send a picture back, you know, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so that wasn't the reason that persuaded you to then move to South Africa, was it? <laughs> no, that that. Uh, anyway, so so then eventually, you know, MTN. I, I ended up having an offer from MTN in South Africa, and few others, uh, but one being Airtel, which I was considering, but outside of South Africa, it was not South Africa. But the, I was sold on the South Africa store, so. Uh, I took the MTN offer, moved to South Africa, right as, as I graduated. So in 30th January, 2006, I moved to South Africa and I started working for MTN and, and you know, mobile money, then MFS Africa, the, the rest is more known. History, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. So you, so you started an MTN in 2006 and then when did you set up MFS? 2010, so... Okay. To cover those four years, it was so, you know, the reason I chose MTN, to be honest, was MTN banking. There was back again, I was already in discussion with MTN, but I was comparing to few other options that I had. And there was a small article in the Financial Times in August, 2005, uh, about MTN partnering with Standard Bank to launch this thing called MTN banking, which, you know, you lose mobile phone to move money around and all that. Then, I don't know, the penny just dropped for me. It was, of course, you know, the telecom mm -hmm. guy in me, like, you know, I understood pretty well the GSM standard and, and all these things and SMS and all that. And I also knew the hassle of sending and receiving money, you know, for all the years I was in Benin, we were more on the receiving side, but by that time, you know, I have lived in France, in the UK, spent some time in Germany with, during the Airbus project. Uh, I have been in the US uh, with INSEAD. I spent two months, three, almost three months in Singapore. And everywhere I've been, I send money, you know, Western Union, MoneyGram, all this. So I use, you name everything, you know, post offices, yeah. everything. And I know the hassle and I, I you know, I'm, uh, I think everybody, anybody who has been a migrant know exactly what I'm talking about. Like sometimes you're sitting in a meeting, you get a call or, you know, that, hey, no, mom right. needs this money. I mean, who are you to question why she needs the money? You just need to right. send the money. And right. you need to now figure out a way to send the money and all that. So when I saw this article, I was like, of course, if you can move data, if you know how to move zero and one across, of course we can move value. You know, the rest is what kind of standard we put around it and you know, GSM work that way. That So the whole thing just kind of came together for me and I was like, no, this is brilliant. And I wrote to MTN and said, hey, I want to come and work for you. Now I've decided this is what I want to do. And so I was thinking like, look, you know, that this idea of really using the mobile to, to move value across will require some sort of equivalent of what happened in the GSM world. 
and you know where we we don't make phone call easily now because uh, you know Verizon or, or France Telecom or Vodafone cover the whole world. It's because we did interconnection, and that that was the world I was coming from. Like we found a way to that I know I can mm. pick up a, an iPhone now, which will connect to maybe a Huawei uh, base station. Um, and make a call to you and maybe you pick it up on a Motorola phone, uh, you know, connected to, I don't know, uh, Ericsson base station. Ericsson. Yeah. And you and I don't even need to think about this. We just take it for granted that we pick up the phone, we make the call, it will work, right? Yeah. So I was thinking like, if you forget all the complications, regulations, settlement, all these things that were also there in the telecom, not to the extent that they are there in, in, in the banking world or the payment world, but I was like, if I can do that, there must be a way where I can exchange a message that says Dare wants to send money to Mohit. Like, just at the, at the logical level. And right. I was thinking, you know, if I can, we can build that, it will, not only it will be a very valuable company, but it will enhance the value of the whole world, of the ecosystem. It will really do what mobile does to, to people in the world, which is be truly connected. Like now it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you are connected to the global world if your phone is working and connected to the right. internet. Right. So kind of the dream was that that be true for mobile money. So if you have a mobile money account, it should be enough to transact with the world, it doesn't matter where you are. And um, so that was kind of the dream. And then on the other side, MTN was also becoming more of a corporate, you know, there was, a whole lot mm. more structures and processes. And, and by then I have learned a lot about myself to know that I'm, I'm not a good corporate guy. You know, I was always crossing lanes. I was, <laughs> so you put those two together, I said like, look, let me, let me jump out and see if I can build this. So and that's how I started MFS Africa. On that, on that so 2010, this, you started MFS and who, you had some people that joined you, right? Very early on, friends and Very early on. Yeah. yeah. So early on, there was first Philip Nielsen, who um, yeah. was in my team in MTN. So for, he was, as a consultant, he was working on Nigeria. He was actually based in Nigeria and helping at that time MTN Nigeria develop MTN mobile money for Nigeria. And we had, uh, Philip in pretty much each of the key markets. Erwan yeah. Jember, who is now the CEO of Jazz in Pakistan, was that in Ghana, in, in, in the team, same team. Uh, a yeah. few other people, but Erwan and Philip and Philip are probably the ones that are still kind of in the industry and, and, yeah. and active. Um, but uh, yeah, so Philip, I, I, I remember when I was just kind of thinking about it, um, I met with him in Barcelona, the, uh, this is now, uh, this is now 2010, February 2010. Um, you know, kind of told him a little bit what I'm thinking. Uh, I was going to put my own savings to get it started uh, if he was interested. And he was doing some work as a consultant for, for Fondamo at that time, that up to June. And he said, well, uh, let me finish this. And after June, I will, I will join you. So that's, you know, Philip joined and, and uh, put, in, put in his money as well in the, in the, yeah. in the kind of seed round that we raised. And Sharon Willong, who is in Cameroon, was, was in, also in my team in Cameroon. She was um, relatively junior at that time, but such a raw talent. And when I left, I was, she was one of the first people I, I called. And she had joined us MTN from the US. So he, she literally, we were advertising for a job and she literally just packed and came and, mm. you know, worked for MTN. And I called her and said, look, I'm, you know, I'm leaving and I'm going to start this company. I would love for you to come with me. And she was like, yeah, just have to convince my parents that <laughs> I'm going to leave MTN and enjoy something we don't even know the name of. But, but she did. And uh, she's still, she's still in South Africa. Yeah, and yeah. and then uh, and then Maz, so Maz, uh, Maz Chaponda, who is our CTO, um, I was I went to school with his brother. I was at NCI, we were in the same class, and we 
he put us in touch when Mars was finishing INSEAD himself and looking for a job, but I was still at MTN. And, you know, I spoke to him about jobs at MTN. And I also told him like, look, I'm also leaving and I'm gonna start this thing. Uh, I, I need a CTO, that's also an option. He said, yeah, that's more interesting. So he, mm. he also joined. And that's, that was the first team. That was kind of the, the initial nucleus. There was also my, my assistant from MTA and joined us, uh, Cindy, Cindy Lee Muller. She didn't stay long, but she joined us uh, at the beginning. But the three others, we are, are still with First Africa. Uh-huh. And that group then, we, with that team and the idea, we raised seed capital, uh, which was mostly angels, uh, mostly people who were in my, school, in my class at INSEAD. Uh, yeah. Quite a few of them by then, you know, work for private equity or McKinsey, made some money. They could afford to lose twenty, fifty thousand dollars, so they gave it to us, and that's how we started. And in yeah. Africa, when you started, and your thinking was, you know, moving money should be as easy as making a call or sending a text message. I mean, was that that was your sort of basic vision, right? But then it, how did it get onto, I think, mm. effectively becoming an aggregator, a, a, a business? Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, and becoming effectively the rail between these telcos because interoperability didn't exist, right? At the in, in those days. I mean it I'm must have been you, really hard. You must have gone through some iterations of oh and, and I'm sure some doubts as well, Dari, like what the hell am I doing here, right? Oh, so many, so many. I'm telling you, and also I can tell you it's also much easier to connect the dots looking backward, as Steve Jobs said, than when you're looking because when you're looking forward. Yeah. You can crumble under the doubt, indeed, because it doesn't, I mean, you have this plan and then it just doesn't work out. Like, yeah. you know, and I, I was joking with someone, like, in my 10 years plus, I haven't seen plan A work once. Once. Never. Whatever it is, it just doesn't work out that way. And uh, the person added, it, it's because it's Africa. So, yeah, maybe, indeed, because it's Africa. But I think it's, 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 it might be it's probably, probably true probably outside true. of Africa yeah. too. But yeah. so I'll tell you what the key, the pivotal moment. So the first one was obviously that I, I, I talked with Mars and explained to him a little bit my vision about the technology and what, what the technology need to be able to do for, to protect the future as we were not clear what's going to happen. Because Remember, we didn't even have a product. What I explain now is not even a product, right? So moving money like this, like it wasn't entirely clear, but I was very clear that we need to have our own platform that we built. And that platform needs to be able to connect to mobile money platforms. And it needs to be able to kind of interact at KYC level. So being able to pull and push KYC information that were on the mobile money platform. You need to be able to debit, you need to be able to credit, and you need to be able to authenticate. You know, use the mobile money P a little bit as electronic signature, not necessarily in the course of a transaction, but being able to use it in isolation as electronic signature. Now, you could ask me why those, because you can actually pre- build pretty much any financial services by recombining these platforms. And I would say <laughs> coming up with this was probably one of five proudest moments for me in Manifest Africa. Because this is like 2010, and T today mm. is still true. That, and you can go and try that for the next week. Any financial service that you can think of, you can combine these four things in a way that you'll do it. Mm. So, so when, when that became clear to me, as, and Maz and I, we, called, we went back and forth a little bit and so on and so on. So we say, okay, once we have this, we need to look to hook this up to mobile networks. Now, why will a mobile network want you to hook this up? Well, they don't. So we thought about value-added services. And value-added services was something that was very, very well known and understood in the mobile world. You know, we, you know, <laughs> ringtones, Bible quotes, jokes, you name it. There was this thing and this idea that a third party can bring a wide range of services connected to the platform, distributed and you do revenue share. And it was codified, there was like contracts to do that and so on. So I thought that was the path of least resistance, that 
we will pitch ourselves as a value added service provider, but focus on mobile money and our attraction will be the portfolio that we create. That, you know, do you want lending? Do you want insurance? We can build this. And we also knew that at that time, mobile networks, now we're talking 2010, 2011, it was still not a success. And a lot of them were busy fighting the war of the distribution, getting the cash in, cash out agents right, getting the pricing right, getting. Mm -hmm. So our pitch was like, why are you fighting that? We can augment the utility for you by bringing other services. We can be your R&D guys. If you want to test things quickly, because you know the, the large providers, the fundamentals at that time, they were so busy just, just do the basic things. They couldn't, they didn't, even if they wanted to, they didn't have capacity Right. To respond to a new innovation service in Uganda and another one in Sierra Leone and another one in Ghana and another one in Zambia. So we were like, no, no problem. You know, what do you want to do? Savings. Yeah, we can, you know, as long as we can hook this thing to the back, we can create mm -hmm. this savings thing. So that was our business initially and that started getting traction. So that got us through the door. But the thing is, once you connected, you connected. You got the footprint, and that's how we started building the, the initial footprint. And I can tell you, it was like four or five years of just that, and mm -hmm. and you make no money really. I mean, because all these services are subscale. We did some really pretty cool stuff, like we did landing products, which you know, story for another day. But it, I, I'm so proud of what we achieved there. We did some insurance product, health insurance. Uh, I wrote about this when we invested in, in inclusivity. We mm. came out with this product about you know, pregnancy insurance for women in Mali who were, people will die because they couldn't pay 50 or $100 for a C-section. And we're mm. like, come on, you can go back to statistic. You know the probability of this happening. And when you're pregnant, you also know for a fact that you will go through a delivery. So, mm. so you have nine months literally to buy an insurance and you, you can price it based on the probability and mobile money can help that. So those were really things that we believe could have huge impact, but for it to have huge impact, it has to be deployed on a large network. And the footprint was going to be necessary, but we were using them as a way to create the footprint and keeping the dream alive a little bit. So we did that, we did some insurance product with um, Alliance in Cote d'Ivoire, with Hollard in Ghana, um, Allianz, uh, NCI in Cote d'Ivoire and this product in, in Mali um, with this savings product, fantastic saving products in Ghana with microfinances and so on. Anyway, so this portfolio of VAS was really our first positioning. And for a while, we thought that could take us through, you know, get revenue and allow us to then use that to fund the build of the network. But eventually, we found ourselves in, in the carbon zone, you know, where we had too many of these small things. We were underfunded, understaffed, but mm -hmm. our vision was still, you know, this Pan African network. And, and uh, yeah, so we had to eventually slowly learn by mistakes also not to do too many things, right. just narrow down. And, and eventually we got lucky again, like around 2014. 2015, mobile money really started becoming a thing. And then the idea of interoperability start coming up. And yeah. Airtel gave us a great help. They put up a press release that they're going to connect all the networks. This was 2014. Like they've done in the telecom world, they had this one network that connected everybody. So they put up this press release out. Airtel was very much into that back then, for forward looking statements. And, and then they got uh, the other guys panicked a little bit, you know, your MTN and Safaricom and, you know, MTN and Safaricom got talking and we were already, we were the best way to fight back because we were already connected uh, to so many. And we have just launched a corridor between Cote d'Ivoire and Benin uh, in West Africa with MTN, which was working pretty well. So that made operability or interoperability a thing early 2015. And then we we signed Vodafone as a group on, onto it. And then you know network effect started. And then eventually we 
we we eventually have Airtel also as a client now as well and so on. Yeah. So yeah. from 2010 to 2014, it was really, uh, you know, the French have a word for it. They call it bricolage. It's, like, <laughs> it's just you're trying, you're hoping that generally is moving into the right direction, but yeah. you're not entirely. Every day does not give you a sense of progress. You have to take a long time to look back to see that you're actually making progress. And then 2015, things accelerated. And I think we, and, and, and we, I think we did well in also executing on that uh, to where we are now. Yeah. And in those four or five years, you, you sort of touched on, there were lots of moments of doubt. And of course, you know, it's easier to look back, but and at any point, did you feel like, you know, this is all too tough and we should just pack it in. And, and if you did, you know, what was the turning point that just kept you going? So I have to say, I only felt that way once and it was really at the end. But along the way, I don't know, I just have this optimism. I don't know, you know, so I, I thank God some time for it. Like, I just, I just look for the next good thing. And that's my coping mechanism. So throughout those years, we had a lot of set like moments. I remember there was one time, I think, I mean, we were $10,000 away from bankruptcy. And I got $10,000 from a friend of mine, Brian Fulmer, he, also an INSEAD guy. He, he was, uh, he was uh, he's in Barcelona. And I don't think he realized <laughs> that literally he kept us in business with $10,000. Like, it, no. it, it was just, it just came at that time. There was another moment, I mean, I borrowed like $5,000 from my sister. And it was so complicated for her to send me the money from, from uh, Canada to Mauritius. It was like, I mean, <laughs> You know, if, if I needed any proof that banking is broken when it comes right. to cross-border payment, it was right there. So we had those moments, but I was not shaken at all. I, I just, I always thought that we would keep going. But, but the moment for me was probably 2014, you know, I think right into the Ebola thing, we were really kind of breathing carbon. We were on a fundraising that was not going well. We ended up agreeing, we agreed to, to do a, a merger, well, I mean, be acquired essentially by, by another company. And, and it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't a clear, it has a taste of defeat in it, a lot of it, but I felt like I owe to everybody who has backed me to land this plane somewhere, even if it wasn't the original destination. So I, I really pulled the deal. I, I, you know, I really work hard on it and, and to build consensus and so on. But as we were going through it, it was just the, the vibe was just not right. And there was a lot of cultural differences, I would say, between us and the company. And to the point where I remember sitting in this, in this taxi, we just launched this cross-border services between Cote d'Ivoire and Benin. This was November, 2014, late November. And I mean, we had maybe three weeks of cash left at that point. And, and I had to fly to Cote d'Ivoire to do this press conference to do that I did. And I remember Cote d'Ivoire, they were doing a lot of work on the roads. It was messy. I was, I mean, this taxi coming back uh, to the airport. When I got a call from the company, we we're trying to get them to give us a loan, I think like $200,000 or something. And they just sent me the loan mm -hmm. agreement. It, it felt like we were selling the company for $200,000. I mean, the covenants, and I, and I just, on the phone, I just told the guy like, no, it's fine, we won't take it. Um, and then I didn't have a solution and I'm, I'm in this taxi and I'm thinking, and, and I got to the airport. So I got to the airport and this is the Bola time. And the plane was delayed, the plane to take me back to South Africa. Um, I think it was supposed to be like 7 p.m. and then it was delayed to be like 1 a.m. or something. And as I'm standing there looking at the board, I got a call from my helper back in South Africa, from the security company that uh, there was, uh, they got an alarm at my place and they were checking and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, please go. And I called the helper and now the helper, helper is shouting. There was a robber in my house. My kids were shouting. I could hear them on the phone. This robber is trying to rape the helper in front of my kids. And I'm sitting at this airport in Cote d'Ivoire and I was like, what the hell are you doing? Like, wow. why? Sitting there like, I mean, I should be home, you know, get a job, go on holiday, you know, 
get a van, get two dogs like everybody else. What's your problem? What are you doing here? And now your family needs you. You're not there. You know, I have no money. I mean, we haven't been on holidays for all this time. Like my electricity was cut multiple times with once in winter. It was just hard, but I was not seeing it. I was just keep going. You know, now looking back, I, you know, and I'm still grateful to my wife who she stuck with me for it, but I just didn't see it. I was getting my kick by just keep going. But at that moment, it all hit me. Like, this is insane. And, uh, and I sat down, I remember, and I got myself a beer. And I was like, okay, I'm going to write down 10 things that when I get back home, I'm going to try. If at the end of the 10 things, I haven't found a way to keep the journey going, I'm going to call it quit. And mm. so I, I had a lot of time to kind of reflect on it. And I wrote down those 10 things. And when I got back to Joburg, you know, late that night, eventually things, you know, my friend came, nobody was hurt. Eventually it was okay, but it took a while to get the family through it. But then I said, okay, I'm going to try these things. And number five was to have lunch with a gentleman called Kumo, who I knew him from MTN and to see. And my, what I was trying was to raise $500,000. I figured that if we could raise $500,000, we will be able to cross over from that year to the next year. And I had quite a bit of hope on the deal that we were discussing with Vodafone at that time. And having done the MTN launch in Cote d'Ivoire and Cote d'Ivoire and Benin, I don't know, my natural optimism was like, if we can land Vodafone, we will be able to raise more money. So, so and if we could raise more money, we will be able to continue. So, yeah, so number five, I, I tried and I had lunch with him and say, hey, can you, you know, can you invest 500,000? And he said, hey, I can't, but there is one guy who may, I, I'll talk to him. And that guy was... Uh, um, gentleman called Moss. Moss. Yeah. He spoke to Moss and Moss, he, he left me a message on my phone. He said, I never listened to voicemail. And this is December in South Africa. You have to remember, nobody works. People just want to go on holiday. It's like August in Europe. And three days later, Kumo called me again and said, Hey, you know, he didn't reply to my message. You know, I, I said, Which message? I don't listen to message. He said, No, but Moss was interested in. He wants to see you before he goes on holiday. Jump into my car and I drove in that metro in Moss. That conversation led to the $500,000, uh, eventually became a million dollar debt. So we, and we closed that deal just before Christmas. And that was it. Then we, raised, then we got to the other side of the year. Um, and we raised, after that, we raised about two and a half million dollars. Mm. And, and that was it. Then we just kind of, you know, from there, there was no, there were, there had been few others, tough moment, 2017, we also, it was quite tough for us to, to, to get to our round, but I don't think I doubted, uh, like I doubt that day at the airport in Abidjan, that was, that was the low for me, that was uh, the moment where I just, I realized how absurd it is actually to chase your dream, like there is a, there is a clear path. <laughs> but sometimes those moments are the real defining moments, right? That real turning point. And of course, this gentleman, as I know, has been with you and, and he, he, he's been uh, and you built a very successful business. So he's very glad, right? It worked out for him, too. So um, which is which is good. <laughs> so Dari, let's fast forward. Um, so MFS is set up. There is a vision. That vision is being sort of changed, but sort of you're there and we fast forward, I mean, but, but when you set it up, did you really think from, you know, what was, I guess was sending money from one phone to another to becoming an aggregator to now, I guess, becoming a pan-African, but also really embarking on global, not just yeah. Africa, but a holistic payments company, right? Which is yeah. not only doing personal payments, but business payments with your recent acquisition. And then of yeah. course you've got a whole pipeline of things. I mean, was that in the plan right at the in part of the dream or did that just no. evolve? 
No, that's just a wrong. I mean, honestly, the dream was as simple as, and I still, even for my, my team, the board, everybody like, when do we know if the job is finished? I say, well, it's easy. Here's my mom's number. She lives in Benin. The job is finished when you can pay her from anywhere in the world. Yeah. Or be paid by her. That's it. So I know that even if you were sitting in Bolivia now or Bangladesh, you take it for granted that you can phone her. I want you to take it for granted that you can pay her or she can pay you. So that has been a constant, but no, the rest, I think it came with people who came to us eventually. And really for me, I have, I, I learned one thing from PwC from one of my, my mentor day, uh, which I brought in that I, I practice as a discipline at MFS Africa is to surround yourself with people who are better than you. And to always, even when you hire, we have something we call it, does this person pass the better than us test? Because better than us will pull us up, will bring other things to us. And mm -hmm. if it's not better than us, then yeah, I don't know. We just need extra hands. And that is a missed opportunity. But well, look, look, look ahead whatever months or years you want to. Um, what does it hold for MFS Africa? And also, what does it hold for Dari? Because I've now known you for five plus years, and I've just seen you grow more and more passionate about this business. So you clearly have that same fire in the belly that you probably did in 2010 when you started it, or even more. I mean, is it is that what you think it is? Just keep doing more and more stuff? Or what do you think? So for the business, I do think, let, let me try the five years. I think, I think five years from now, even if it's not in its current shape and form, MFS Africa will have built an infrastructure that will be vital for 100 million of people across Sub-Saharan Africa and possibly the whole of Africa. And it will be like the roads people travel on and don't remember who built them. It will just be that piece of infrastructure. I think five years mm -hmm. from now, we will be playing, we will be in the fabric of trade and payment in pretty much all countries of Africa. Yeah. Um, so that that's, I'm pretty convinced about that uh, for, for the company. For Dare, <laughs> I think I still have a little bit to give. I still have a role to play in guiding us toward that. Uh, but I'm also conscious that I have an expiry date, like every CEO, right? So I don't know when it is, but every year I check with myself, <laughs> was it last year? <laughs> because I want to be aware of it if, you know, I want to see it first before, before other people see it. Although I'm sure other people will see it before I do. But, but, but I do think that for the next, you know, for this kind of time horizon, I, I, I have, I still have something to give in, in guiding it. But I'm also conscious that I see other problems that I'm equally passionate about. I'm passionate about education on the continent. And the COVID thing has really, really highlighted for me the imbalance in access to education that eventually lead to your ability to sustain shocks. Like, you know, if your job is a white collar job, if you had the chance to train as an accountant or an engineer, COVID was thing you discussed with your friend over Zoom. Mm. If you didn't have education, you end up in some sort of jobs that, you know, manual factory worker and so on. COVID is a very different experience. And, and all that started with the access, the opportunity you have, not your abilities, of course, ability is played, but on this continent, there's still so much that gets decided pretty early on, on education that you get and the chance that you get there. So I, I think there's just not enough being done about this. And I'm, you know, the other day I was arguing with someone, I'm actually tired of FinTech a bit in Africa as being the only thing. It looks like we collectively lack imagination and, and mm -hmm. moving money around is the only problem we have on the continent. I think there's a massive problem on education and we have to rethink it. We cannot, sometimes you have to push, you know, step and say, okay, it's not working. We've been hundred years on this path since the colonization to where we are now, it's not working. 
We, it's mm. just not fast enough. It's not, so we have to think it in. I, I want to apply my mind a little bit to this. I want to, you know, see if I can connect some dots on this. Um, and I was probably, I would probably want to do something around that. You know, I, health is another one. Um, I'm, again, really brought to the front with COVID. But I also feel like there's a whole lot more being done there. Uh, because it's so critical, you know, it's a matter of life and death. So people are a whole lot more sensitive. Whereas the mistake we make in education, they build up gradually. Therefore, we don't feel it. And it's only at the end that we see it. And I think I would like to see if I can bring something to that, uh, you know, for the next 10, 15 years. I don't know what it is yet, but uh, if I'm not doing MFS Africa, I'll probably be doing something in education. Well, I think MFS Africa still needs you, but if, I'm sure yes. this time you decided to do something new, there'd be no <laughs> sort of people that would want to fund you, Dari, that's for sure. So, <laughs> okay. uh, let's close it by just one last piece of advice to another Dare who's starting out his journey now, like you did 20 plus years ago, and looking to do what you, you know, you've gone through. What would be your advice to mm. somebody like that? I think number one will be authenticity and pure relations. Like, because when I look back again, I can tell you Mohit, it was the people around me who carried me. Mm. And uh, so people talk a lot about networking and my view of that is you eventually get out what you put in. So my advice will be to, to really, to build genuine, trusting relations. Great, and never give up just like you did, so which is great. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. you, you could carry on for hours, as you know. But I, I, I really, know. I really want to thank you for this. This has been great. And uh, I can't wait till we do this in person. So uh, thanks very much. Me too. Thanks so much. Keep well. And yeah, London or Joburg. <laughs> Thank you.